It has been a week full of mock drafts. And last but not least, it is Mr. Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs draft. So stay tuned and find out who are his big surprises, if he has any, and who just missed his cut for the lottery. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I appreciate it. I'm sure Richard does and the rest of the NBA Big Board crew. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. That's because Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. All right. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies, and my co-host for today is Mr. Mavs Draft, Richard Stamen. Richard, what's going on, man? And how difficult was it to put together a mock draft this early in the season? Dude, it's hard. It's not easy at all. There's about 25 guys where I'm like, yeah, yeah, lottery potentially. And then I have to cut it to 14 and I'm like, oh, I'm sweating, dude. Like, I don't know who to who to cut. I don't want to be wrong, which is a hard part of which honestly I feel like makes it worse. But I'm excited for it. Yeah, I mean, we're going to be wrong. We're, we're <laughs> just we're going to be wrong simply because we are basing our mock drafts off what we see. And for the most part, we don't have the same intel you know, of what goes on behind the scenes and that yep. heavily impacts draft. We don't have access to medical records. We don't have access to, you know, all the behind the scenes intel that, that goes on from like the the background checks. So we're we're gonna be wrong. And and that's the easy thing. The hard part is when you are somewhat of a media personality and you post your big board or your mock draft and you talk about it just dealing with the trolls or people that disagree, which which is okay. I mean, that that's kind of like the beauty in it. But I know at this early, you're going to get a whole bunch of, are you serious? And then different breaks, especially when you do the teams, because when you do the teams, like, I mean, if you have the Pistons third and you have Amon Thompson as your third guy, like I did, you know, that <laughs> is an absolutely terrible fit. Right. So, um, yeah, it's 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 all fun, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not putting Kai Soto on here, so that'll uh, that'll reduce. Uh, I think a lot of. Oh, I feel like if I say his name, a million people tune in. So pretty good <laughs> and bad. Man, you know, it's like I had those conversations about him. I don't know prior to the draft, and at least twice a week, I get someone that comments <laughs> or they. I, I think some of it are bots, but some of it somebody comments and they're just like, you stop being a hater. <laughs> and then I saw somebody made an account that's like Kai Soto didn't get drafted <laughs> or something like that. Whatever. So, all right, let, let's just get right into it. All right. The biggest surprise that is not in your lottery so far. I think the surprise isn't based on current play. But I think if you had asked two, three weeks ago, they would have been in there. And they're just two guys, I, I think two guys that, I mean, we talked about it a lot over like in September and October about these two being surprise players. Both of them kind of dealt with early season injuries, but they didn't miss too much time. But the Duke guys, I mean, Dariq Whitehead and Derek Lively just haven't played well enough to be on this lottery mock yet. And I think that's a surprise to preseason me. I mean, you know, I had... I had Derek Lively as the best non Wembenyama scoot guy, but he's just been so passive that, yeah, I know. I, know, I saw that face. I saw that. I face. didn't have him that high. I tell you that much. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go with we. So we both take the fall. Nah. <laughs> I, I definitely was aware over Lively guy. Yeah, you were. Would you say you were uh, aware of the flaws that Lively had? No, I just. That, that's no, I was very, going for the pun. Great, great play on words. No, I just. <laughs> He's a guy that does a few things good. I just don't know offensively what he does well. Like if he played with a lot of energy and his motor was great, yeah. he's a top seven guy. But I don't see like a great motor. And again, you got to 
you know, take everything with a grain of salt. He missed a lot of time with the with the calf injury. I don't think Duke's chemistry is, is good right now. Not like behind the scenes. I'm just talking about trying to fit all their pieces together. I don't think their chemistry is good, which is understandable. You had two guys that were projected starters that probably weren't involved in any of the preseason drills or camps and all of that. And, you know, they still have plenty of time to figure it out. But I, I agree. I mean, I had... I had Whitehead at the very end of my lottery, and it was based off of projection, not future play. I think that he might have a better path to stepping his numbers up than Lively. Um, but Lively's not even playing like – I think he's had like three games where he's played like 20 minutes. I don't think he's had a double-double game, nope. and I haven't seen him make a jump shot. Maybe he has. Well, he hasn't made a three-pointer as of today. And that was kind of one of the things that people liked about him was that they thought that he was like this defensive anchor and they thought he was a, a guy that could space the floor. And maybe he can do it. He's just not allowed to do it at Duke. So it's tough. What are your thoughts on, on Whitehead so far? Yeah, I, he's trending up. I mean, he's had a few good games where it's like, of course, it's within, I say good, it's kind of relative on that. Um, he's had, I don't think he's even had a double digit scoring game yet. But in the last four, I mean, against Iowa, I thought he looked good. Boston College, he looked good. He played Ohio State. Didn't look terrible in the 13 minutes. Uh, and then the Purdue game, I could have done without. But overall, I mean, compared to his season average, he's shooting like fine, 42% from the field. I don't have a problem with it, given the minutes and the volume. My one concern with with Whitehead, though, is just his shot looks kind of weird. Like, I've always been a guy, I mean, like just with shooting form in general, where I don't, I don't know how to do this. So like, if you're watching on YouTube, like you'll see it. A lot of people, the shots go like this, right? The guide hand stays put. What he does is he shoots, but his hand goes like here. It's almost like he's mailmanning it. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I can't really describe it. And I think that's something that's got to be fixed. And I think he'll see more shot consistency. Like I genuinely believe that the guide hand really does wonders in shooting and it can, you know, just a little tick of a change can change a lot. So um or like on the motion i think that's something he needs to look for that's yeah i i could definitely i could definitely see that what do you, what are your thoughts about his athleticism it hasn't popped like i thought it would i uh, i think in high school we saw him be like this athletic three level scorer I, I was enamored by that haven't seen that yet just the athleticism hasn't translated to half court play just yet i don't know if that's part of that chemistry or what but i'd like to see that a bit more do you think the injury is oh, yeah. related to that because I mean that's he also, wasn't a guy that to me got great separation as is, and, and so I don't know if the injury is the big issue or just the defenders are better. It's, it's hard to could be both. It's, re it's really hard to gauge, and that's what kind of makes it a difficult so early <laughs> right right now because you have two guys. Really, there's four guys that. A lot of people were high on four freshmen, Cam Whitmore, Nick Smith, Lively, and, and Whitehead that you can say they aren't 100% healthy. But Cam Whitmore and Nick Smith were out longer and have already showed more in this week than the Duke guys showed over. I think they've played at least nine or ten games by now. Yeah, I, I agree. And we'll hear those names later. Is there anybody else that – missed your, your lottery that you think could potentially be a lottery pick when it's all said and done? I I had a lot of preseason hope for this last one, um, but I just don't know what his fit is at Houston, and I think that's kind of my issue where he's getting some numbers, like he's taking nine shots a game, but Jairus Walker, I just don't think he's a fit there, and I, I think he's just not comfortable in the role yet. Houston doesn't look to seem to have like integrated him well. I moved him out of the mock draft lottery for now. Um, but I'm open to seeing if, you know, he can play in that off ball role right now. He's playing like a, a rookie in an NBA system mm -hmm. where, you know, he's just, Hey, put him in the corner and let him, let him find whatever comes his way. But, you know, it's hard to develop in that way, but also can you blame Houston? Like they're trying to win a title. Yeah. Which on one hand, I think that could like be beneficial for him because that is similar to the role that he would likely play. Like I had him going to, Portland on my last mock, and I used 538.com, and they had the Blazers missing the playoffs, which I don't like, but they had the Blazers missing the playoffs, and I had them going 13th. And when I thought about it, I was like, 
well, dang, he's playing the same exact role he would play if he landed on Portland at, at least early in his career as a guy that's just going to rebound, be physical, and just, you know, just be a – just a role player. I was at the St. Mary's game um, on Saturday because it was in Fort Worth. I just wasn't impressed. <laughs> he looked – I mean, he physically he's impressive. Like you, you see how big and how strong he is. And then I had mentioned a few days ago, he 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 was, you know, seeing him next to um, Arsenal, and one looks like a freshman, and one looks <laughs> like, yep, like he's already done four years at the the best strength and conditioning program in in, in the country. But I mean, he didn't look good against St. Mary's. It looks like he was trying to force the issue and drive, and he just just did not look good but it's crazy because Houston is number one in the country and you can say Walker hasn't really played up to his strength and and Sasser is surprisingly shooting like 31 percent from three and if they get those guys clicking it's gonna be it's gonna be tough to tough to 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 beat that team all right when we return we'll get into Richard's lottery it'll be interesting to see what he has going on but if you are interested in a masterclass, then you have to check out masterclass. So you may ask, what is a masterclass? A masterclass offers classes on a wide variety of topics, all taught by world-class instructors at the top of their fields. Each class is broken into individual video lessons, usually around 10 minutes long, and members can explore at their own pace. And each class is supported by downloadable materials, class guides, recipes, and more. Masterclass is accessible on your phone, web, smart TV, and available on audio mode. To listen to the classes on the go, you can find all available at masterclass.com. There's over 2,500 videos from 180 plus of today's most brilliant minds are available. And they're anytime, anywhere on iOS, Android, desktop, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and the annual membership starts at just $15 a month. There is a wide variety of topics taught by the best, so you can learn how to write anything from a book or screenplay to just a letter. You want to learn how to communicate with your boss or your family or how to make a dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just how to make really good scrambled eggs. Whatever you're interested interested in, there's a class for you. Over 180 exclusive classes taught by the instructors you know and love. Here are some of the instructors. Chris Voss on The Art of Negotiation. John Legend teaches on songwriting. John Douglas on how to think like an FBI profiler. Mariah Carey teaches using the voice as an instrument. And Bob Iger teaches business strategy. Gordon Ramsay teaches cooking. Those are just some of the courses. And there are 2,500 classes, 180 instructors. There's video content on your streaming platform. So please check it out. So once again, check it out at masterclass.com. All right, next, if you are a small business and you're looking for candidates, then you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. If you are hiring, just add your job and the purple hiring hashtag frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are looking for help. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs as number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. Join LinkedIn Jobs, and it will help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your profile for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, it is available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with my co-host, Richard Stamen. All right, so in your mock draft, did you do it based off of teams on Tankathon, or is it just your top 14 guys? No, the the you know the standings are just a little bit too volatile at this point. I just did top 14 because if I do seven uh, being the Bulls pick to the Magic, tomorrow it could be nine or ten, five even. So I didn't 
didn't want to do team based. All right. So I did I did team based. Everybody's running from team based right now. I'm Everybody's a coward, running. dude. Like I'm a coward. <laughs> I, I well, at least the locked on guys. I, I did mine and I, I went to 538. I wanted to do Tankathon, but you know, just based off of it's kind of what made it fun because the Lakers were still well, the Pelicans pick, which goes to the Lakers, was still in like the top seven. You had Orlando with two lottery picks, you had teams like the Blazers and the Clippers were in the lottery. If I, uh, I think at I think the Mavs were in the lottery on Saturday, but then they won and then they're out. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it is, it is fun to me. All right. So at number 14, who is the 14th guy on your board? Oh man, we're, we're starting backwards. You're making it hard. You're not, you're not letting me go down easy. Okay. I thought we because were everybody with, uh, knows three, number one. one and two. <laughs> everybody I, knows. We don't even need to talk about those guys. We've talked about them. <laughs> a season's go... worth of content before the season started. <laughs> I'm going to start with uh, 14, I think, is, is going to be a little bit controversial. Um, That's what we're here for. We, we... Yeah, that is exactly. <laughs> like, I know I know this is going to be terrible. So, like, and I'm not trying to, like, self-deprecate myself. Uh, although I kind of am. But I just, I genuinely don't know. Like, it's, it's so volatile. And again, there's, like, 20 guys. But... For me, I'll start with at the back, Julian Phillips. Like I, I talked about him. I really do like him at 6'8". I think he can do so much. I think he's going to be able to shoot. Um, I fully buy that. I think he's going to be a, at least a fine defender and just can fill the stat sheet. You look at what he can do just a, on both ends. I think teams are going to find that, especially winning teams, they're going to value that. Like a team that just missed the playoffs could probably view him as like a free agent acquisition in a way. Yeah, he's been surprising to me, honestly. And I had him at 19 on, on my mock. And, of course, there's such a wide range of guys. And he was someone that coming into the year I thought was going to average less than double figures. I did not think that he'd be really productive. I thought he'd kind of blend in with their veteran team at Tennessee. I did not realize. I, I would have never guessed that he would be their leading scorer. And he's their leading scorer. And he's averaging 12 points, like five rebounds, two assists. And he's been inefficient. And if he gets the shot to fall, then he could be like the biggest, the biggest riser in this class. But if you would have told me that, you know, he'd be their leading scorer, I would have been like, you're crazy. And he's doing this shooting like what, 38% from the floor, 21% from deep. Once he gets going in the second half of the season, he could be that guy that ends up having like this crazy rise yeah i i like him a lot um you want me to go to 13 yep man i i just feel like i'm gonna get roasted at this point for Who some, cares? some of these people off but Forget 13 them. i'm gonna go with grady dick i think we've seen a, a trend of best shooter in the draft starts to go lottery i mean it's been two straight years we, we learned from desmond bain uh, but even then you could argue people said aaron neesmith was the best and he went uh, I think he went 14th, uh, maybe 15th, something like that. Small but, sample size that year, though. Which is exactly why I was low on him. Like, I mean, and he played nobody. But um, it yeah, worked so for Garland. So. <laughs> What'd you say? It worked for Garland. Same school, crazy stats. True. Short true. sample size. But uh, there were way more risks. But yeah, yeah, Grady Dick, the thing for me is just, I mean, we've seen White out shooting at any angle, at any spot, like, and he's also able to use his shooting gravity, not only to create for others, not like in a high level, but like he, he sees the floor. He's not Cam Thomas in, as a scorer or something like he, he sees teammates, but like he also just knows how to use his gravity really well, just in a winning environment. And I think that's really helpful. 48, 45, 80 shooting splits, <laughs> <laughs> which is good, Man. but there's another guy <laughs> that has crazy shooting splits. All right. Number 12. All right. Uh, number 12, I'm going to go with Anthony Black. Um, I I was almost going to leave him off, but the game he had in was it the battle for Atlantis um, was just such an impressive game. I think it's six, seven as a, I don't know if he's a guard or a wing. I still don't know. Uh, ball actually, player. Two, he has two games. Ball <laughs> yeah. He's just a, he's, that's exactly it. Like, dude, he's just a ball player. Like in those two games against Creighton and Louisville, he looked really good in that he he shot a combined 19 of 29, which is 65% shooting. I'm willing to take that flash as an entire just basis of uh, taking him so high. So I really like him. 
I'm still not a believer in the shot, but he's shooting 39% from three. Yeah. I'm I'm the same <laughs> way. I don't know how much I believe it. But it, hey, it, it, it's weird, right? If you would have said at after about what maybe 10 games or so that Anthony Black would be shooting a higher percentage from three than Marcus Sasser, I would have said you are crazy. Totally different level of shots, but he's shooting 39% from three. If he can sustain the shooting, he could be in the top half of the lottery. Yeah, easily, yep. easily. All right, number 11. <sighs> um, I, I'm going to go with Case and Wallace. I, I love the energy he plays with. I think some of the stats are going to get evened out. I think he's overachieving on shooting. I mean, he's shooting 50% on three and a half attempts right now, but also 50% from the line. Both of those will normalize. But 41% for three. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even Oche Baji, like he did that till like February last year and that even came down. So like, Case is yeah. good, but I just I really love the energy he plays with. I think the defense fully translates. We're going to be seeing teams going for that Tyrese Maxey uh, every time now. I think out of Kentucky, it's it's a trend at this point. Um, and Tyrese wasn't even the first guy, obviously, but I think that's really helpful. And uh, you know, he his brother Keaton, I saw him a lot at UTSA. They both play with that just same energy. They I hate saying this in such a cliche way, but I mean, like they both just got that dog in them, you know, like <laughs> joking aside, really, like, they really do. Like yeah. they, they play with, they have the bulldog mentality. They play with a ton of energy. There's nobody, they can be matched up against six, 10 guys. They don't care. They're still going to play 110% and, and not let them walk over them. Yeah. Shout out to their cousin and trainer, Terrell Harris. All right. Number 10. All right. This is where I think from here, it starts getting hard and you're going to start noticing names that just don't show up, but uh, I'm going with Khalil Ware at Oregon. I I think he's been incredibly impressive. I just think the value of a big kind of drops him down a little bit. I got him at number 10. And based off the 538 yeah, mock, cool. he was going to the Knicks. So, of course, you know, no matter who the Knicks <laughs> have or you have on your board for the Knicks, there's going to be 10 people that are going to call you an idiot. <laughs> but I'm like, if he's – unless you just think Mitchell Robinson is your center of the future, that's fine. But I think where if the shot continues to fall, you have a rim runner, a vertical lob threat, a shot blocker, and a floor spacer. And then the game against UConn, which UConn is very good right now, I think that was the game that just showed you his potential. 18 points, nine rebounds, two of three from deep. Not expecting that consistently. Um, but if the shot, which that was the thing, a lot of people felt like between him and Lively – it was a debate over who had the better shot indicators and who was going yeah. to shoot and where made more threes in the, the UConn game than lively has made all season. So I have him at number 10 too. So we're consistent there. Ooh, good. That's, that's always good to, to hear a little backing. Um, <laughs> you want to go uh, on number nine? I, I am not the, <laughs> I am not the representative for accuracy here <laughs> at, at number nine, who, who's number nine on your list. Yeah, this one is a ridiculously hard one for me because I could see this guy even going all the way up to like seven, but I'm just going to take him now. I, I still really don't understand how he's not consensus in this range, but Gigi Jackson, um, I really like him being 17 years old and doing what he's doing, really looking so composed for the most part on a kind of lost team. I really like him. I think at 6'10", 6'9", whatever he is he can play a lot of different roles and I think it's really beneficial to him and teams are going to take a chance on that youth. I think he'll kill it in open workouts and just draft pre-draft workout season. Yeah. 17 years old, 17 points, seven rebounds per game. The shooting is good. I think he's what 30, like 37% from three Yep, can handle the ball. And I had him at number 16 on my board. And again, like, like you've been saying, it's, it's tough. He could go from 16. He could go top half. I do think the numbers are going to drop once he gets to conference play. And I think by the end of the season, he's just going to get beat up because he's going to have to carry such a heavy load. And um, it, it's interesting because you're like, if he goes to North Carolina, he's not – in this draft range. He's only showing little flashes here and there. Maybe he's playing a role like Jairus Walker, but not even starting. <laughs> so 
going to a, a bad South Carolina team might have been the best thing for his draft stock. And I wonder going forward, is that something that you're going to see from prospects? Like, you know, instead of going to, you know, this blue blood school, I'm going to go get my get my shots off at, you know, this power five school that doesn't have a whole lot of talent. And, um, you know, one of the guys uh, in, in the uh, comments had mentioned it a, a few weeks back about he, he thinks that would be the best route for a prospect is to do the D.G. Jackson route. All right. When we return, we'll we'll finish it off. But I got to let everybody know about Bet Online because Bet Online is one the title sponsor for today, and it is the number one source for all of your sports betting needs. And you can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. Everything is at betonline.net. And if you love podcasts, you can find those also at betonline as well. It is the fastest and the easiest way to get your betting fixed. So head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online is where. The game starts. All right. We are down to, are we at number seven? Yep. Yes, we are. All right. I'd like to, I'd like to preface this with um, a quick shout out to, I I laughed at you almost. I feel like, or at least grinned really hard. And I was like, dang, I did not expect that about eight months ago when you said this player was in your lottery and I, I got to give you props. You saw that so far in advance and I see the light like no other. I and that's no Trick Wavy on Smith. About. Oh, you got Trick on in the lottery. Yeah, dude. I, I mean, not even just in the lottery this high. I mean, it, it, it's a couple of things. One, the dude is Bones Highland 2.0. I actually think he's a little bit better of a prospect who coming out actually a lot. Like I've been in the lottery. I didn't have Bones that, that high. Um, So that's first things first, but also just the number one sophomore in the class, like not only do they go high, that's always a top pick, but two, the success rate is ridiculous. I mean, we're seeing it with Benedict Mather and he was the number one. I think of the last, I did a, I went through each draft. I, I, it's kind of a vague study of like what is a hit, but it, I did basically somebody who just wasn't a bust. Derek Williams was probably the worst number two, or I'm sorry, the worst sophomore of the last 15 years to, or like 12 years, something like that since 2010 to get drafted. And even then he had a pretty long career. So for me, I'm looking at it like the best sophomore has a really, really good chance of being a good player. So I'm buying into that. That's why I have to equate on so high. I didn't even have to crave on in my lottery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened. We did a role reverse. <laughs> no, I, I I like him a lot. Um, I, I do. And I was, I mean, I did this before the 33 point game against Coppin state and you know, my, you know, everybody's mock draft is so fluid. It's going to change over time. But one of the things I do like about to as he's more than doubled his assist numbers, the shooting is, I mean, it's not crazy. He's not. He's not efficient. And no, um, but... hold on, though. Hold on. He takes only like he's he can't touch the one, three point line. He can't even go near. It. He's taking deep, deep threes, and he's still hitting thirty five percent. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I do think that. I think that people. I see it two ways. I can see teams saying, "Okay, this is like your Bones Highland, Jordan Poole. We're not going to miss out on those guys anymore." And then I could also see somebody overthinking it and saying he doesn't have a true position is are you going to take a guy in the lottery that is probably going to be like your your microwave six man score I don't know I think it's he's definitely an acquired taste I'm a big Turquavion guy but hey I, I can't believe that you you have him higher than me on your board <laughs> yeah I, shout out to you I feel like I owe you a drink or something for, for Turquavion for showing me the light so at number six, though, um, I'm going to go with the guy we talked about him earlier. It's very, very small sample size. But just the fact that after one game where he only played six minutes, the next two he got real minutes and just went off. Uh, granted, the competition was meh. Still, Nick Smith really stood out to me. I really liked everything he did. I was a little bit skeptical of uh, him being a top guy. But, I mean, here he is, number six on my board or for mock draft. Yeah, it's unfortunate. We're not going to be able to see that whole Arkansas group at full strength with – Brazil being out yeah. for the year with a torn ACL. What have your thoughts been about Anthony Black and Nick Smith together? I don't have a ton of thoughts. Um, I think they can work together. Uh, like obviously they're both getting stats, but uh, they still have to figure that out. I think it's a lot of what a lot of freshman programs are going around right now. I mean, Duke's figuring out Arkansas is figuring out. I think give them a month. They'll be a lot better. All right. Number five. So number five, I uh, got your guy here. Keontae George. Uh, okay, I, so you got Keontae over over Nick. 
Yeah, just because I feel like it, it's a little bit of the we've seen more, which is an unfair thing to Nick Smith. But I also did like Keontae preseason, so I'm kind of just holding true to that. I mean, Keontae every game but one against UCLA where he kind of had a terrible game. Um, he's had double-digit points, and he's just looked really polished on both ends, I would say, doing a lot. I mean, he's a stats sheet stuffer. Like, he's getting a lot of assists. He gets steals. I mean, he'll even get blocks. He plays defense. He scores crazy well, and his shot is beautiful. Yeah, he hasn't been efficient, though. That's that's no. the thing. He hasn't been it. efficient. And I think he's kind of creeping up into, like, Brandon Miller divisive range. Like, there's some people that like him, and then there are people – that I shouldn't say that don't like him, but I think Sam didn't even have him in his lottery. And I feel like if you look at Keontae's shooting splits, they're they're not really good right now. I think he's like 39%. There are people that feel like he's not athletic enough to be able to really create his own shot. I've, I felt like from the beginning, the fit was going to be really interesting at Baylor, basically playing like the same position as their two returning scorers. And I think that he has changed the narrative on him as a passer. The whole selfish, high volume score, you know, needs a ton of shots to be effective um, label. Um, I think he's done a good job in kind of shedding that. I think he's done pretty good on defense. And he's one of these guys, if the shooting comes along, like we talked about with Julian Phillips, then I mean, he's going to be really, really good for Baylor. All right, so we're at number four. Yeah, and I'm going to go with Brandon Miller. I think that North Carolina game is a pretty big scar on him, but um, he's shooting 40% for the year. I get it. If you take that game out, that 4 of 21 performance, he's shooting almost 46%. Like, it rounds up to 46. I get it. He's divi- he's, he's a little bit polarizing. The production's just been unreal, uh, and I think given his size and skill set and three-point scoring, I, I think it's hard to pass him up as a top-five pick at, at this moment. However, I think he is one of the most susceptible to falling down very quickly in this board, mostly because of other guys emerging. All right, so we're at number three. Yeah, number three. Right, I've hold, got on, hold on, hold on. I got, I got to do, I'm not good at math here. All right, so we got Vic, we got Scoot, we have Cam Whitmore missing, and we have both Thompson twins. Oh, missing. man. My math was off. I did 15. Well, uh, I completely miscalculated this when I did it. I left out the Thompson twins by accident. I really do like uh, Amen. So this is an absolute flaw. By nature of injury, I will leave out Cam Whitmore, I guess. He, he is really high on my board, though. I do think he would go higher. I apologize for that. That was an absolute dud. I was supposed to have Cam at four, Amen at three, actually. But um, for this sake, let's go take Amen Thompson at three. Well, what are your thoughts on his brother? You know, his brother is shooting 42.9%. So I intentionally three. left him out. My my one reservation with him is I don't think, like Amen's, or I'm sorry, Osar's, his shot has been a lot better. I just don't think he's an alpha, and I think his shot still is a risk. And that, to me, worries, like, that worries me so much. Amen runs a beautiful pick and roll where, yeah, you can go under his screen, but he still makes you pay. That's advanced. That's heavily advanced stuff. Um, so I really like him. I don't think I don't think his brother can do that as well. See, I think he can. I just think that he is used to playing off the ball because he's used to playing with his brother. But I think he's if he one of the better wing passers in his class, and I think he could be a secondary, secondary ball handler passer. But the shooting, I don't think the numbers can sustain. But I have to say that I'm stunned that he's shooting 43 percent from three. Yeah, I, I think. I think he's going to get hurt more by their age and competition factor than Amen is for what it's worth. Like he's 20 years old and hasn't played above overtime elite, like and com- like organized for a season. I think he's Osar is going to get hurt a lot more than Amen is. I think they're both going to go pretty high. I, I think that <laughs> I think that uh, you can't hold it against one and and then the other. So yeah, all right at at three. So let's let's take Amen. Um, I can't believe I didn't double check my work. I was I was so sure I had it perfectly organized, and here I am having it perfectly organized. If I had my way, I'd bump out Phillips, bump everyone else down, and put Whitmore at four, and um, Amen at three. That's so how I would do it. Combine the twins into one person. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> just combine the twins. <laughs> well, we don't need to go too much into detail about who's one and and who's two. It's Wimbayama and Scoot. I don't think anybody has done enough to 
to join that that range. So we'll we'll save those guys for another episode somewhere down the line. Like I said, I think we've had like a whole season's worth of content on Wimbayama in school, even in like October. <laughs> and so we'll we'll definitely do like a you know a, a check in on those guys later on. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for you, the listener, for making the Locked On NBA Big Bro podcast your first listen. For your next next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. It is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Once again, I am Rafael Barlow. He is Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs Draft, and we are out. <laughs>